So thanks everybody for sticking around for this last talk. Uh, so today I'll talk about this epigenetic landscapes and chromatin organization. Uh, so mostly actually I'll talk about the second part, chromatin organization. Uh, landscapes I think I've talked about in the last meeting and if I have time I'll just briefly talk about it towards the end. Uh, so Devashish has already given a sort of introduction to this problem of how do chromosomes organize. Uh, but for a bacterial cell, so I'll be talking more in more general terms of human nucleus and human chromosomes. Uh, but again, from a very coarse grained, uh, very uh, high level sort of uh, picture. So we will not be looking really at biological details, but more at some coarse grained physical properties. So the basic uh, question is this, that if you look at our DNA, uh, sort of uh, DNA, that has some 10 to the power of 9 of that order of base pairs. And if you stretched out your DNA, that would be something of the order of three to six meters, right? Um, but this, you now have to take this string-like object, which is around meters in length, and you need to pack it inside a nucleus, which is of the order of microns. And then there needs to be some organizational principle as to how you do this folding of this uh, chromatin or the chromosomes inside the nucleus, because the cell sort of needs to know that if it wants to read off a gene, exactly where it should go and look. So, First, I'll just briefly run through what is known experimentally uh, about the properties of this organization. Um, so one thing is clear is that there is a hierarchical folding. If you start from the DNA double helix, uh, at the first stage, this DNA sort of wraps around these histone proteins. So these pink balls over here are these histone proteins, and they form a structure which is called the nucleosome. Uh, this nucleosomes then further coil and wrap around themselves to form something like a 30 nano, what is called a 30 nanometer fiber, and then that somehow folds into some higher order structures, and then that gives you the chromosome. Uh, and this, this picture that we have in mind of chromosomes is actually only true when the cell is dividing. In general, it's actually a blobby mess. So as far as this picture goes, up till this, up till this picture of nucleosomes and so on is experimentally confirmed. Beyond that, we really do not have much idea of what are the folding principles involved. So one of the things that you might expect, so the humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so 23 into 2, 46 polymer strands. So one thing you might expect if you put these uh, n number of polymer strands into a confined volume, which is the nucleus, you might expe expect all of them to sort of interpenetrate each other. But that is not what is seen. In fact, what is seen is that these chromosomes, these different chromosomes, actually segregate very nicely into different territories. So these are called the chromosome territories, and each color marks sort of different chromosomes. You see one, two, three, four, all the way up to 23. These are the 23 pairs of human chromosomes. So one is that, unlike this equilibrium picture that we might expect, uh, there is actually a segregation of chromosomes inside the nucleus, and which is called these chromosome territories. So that's one thing we would like to understand. Secondly, what is known is that the level of packing of these chromosomes is not uniform. There are regions of the chromosome which are very tightly packed, and there are regions which are somewhat loosely packed. So these dark spots over here, which is called the heterochromatin, it's packed more tightly. These white spots, which are called the euchromatin, they're packed more loosely. And what differentiates these two is a sort of functional role. The genes that are required for the cell to perform its functions they are the ones that are present in the euchromatin region, so they're packed a bit more loosely so that they're more accessible when the cell wants to read off the information in the gene. Those genes that are not necessary for that particular cell type to function, those are packed a little bit more tightly, and those are in this heterochromatin region. So there's a differential level of packing. Um, yes, yes. So there have been a, lot, a proliferation of actually experiments in this field which have given us very nice quantitative data. And this is a particular set of experiments which are called the HI-C experiments which stand for chromosome confirmation capture. And what you get out, so I will not describe the experiment, but what you get out of this are these contact matrices which tells you that if I am somewhere along this chromosome strand, how often do I come into contact with another segment of the chromosome that is some distance away? not necessarily nearest neighbors or something. So this diagonal, so this is uh, for human chromosome 14, and these are the various base pairs on this axis and on this axis. You would expect that the diagonal is the brightest, which is, so the intensity of this red color sort of determines the number of contacts. So the diagonal is the brightest, which is natural because you have nearest neighbor interactions or contacts. 
But what you see is that it's not some homogeneous, smooth sort of color slowly decaying away from the, from the diagonal line. Right? There is structure in these maps, which says that there is additional structure to this folding uh, that we do not really completely understand. And this structure persists at many scales. So if you blow up this region, you still see these structures. If you blow up somewhere over here, then again, you see, still see these structures. And also what this allows us to do is that you, from these contact probability data, uh, you can calculate, uh, sorry, from these contact matrices, what you can calculate is the contact probability, which tells us what is the probability that two segments of the chromat chromatin fiber, they come, which are S base pairs apart, so this is distance in base pairs, what is the probability that these two segments, separated by S base pairs, they come into contact with each other. And if you plot that data from experiments, uh, there appears to be a nice power, and that contact probability roughly scales as 1 over S. Hmm? There is a cutoff. So it's over, it's over a reasonable range, but uh, there is a cutoff. And this exponent, this uh, minus 1, this is the mean exponent, uh, there is a variation in that. If you looked at different chromosomes, so this is data from some human cell line, I've forgotten what this is. Um, so this is chromosome X, chromosome 11, 12, 19, and so on. You'll see there is a sort of spread of that exponent, uh, 0 0.93, 1.08, 1.3. The mean is roughly around 1. Um, and this also differs from cell type to cell type, depending on which cell type you're talking about, you'll have different chromosomes folded to different extents. But roughly the exponent scaling is minus one. Um, oh, so this is actually data that shows that this chromosome packing itself is an indicator of the functional state of the cell. So this is data from one cell, one cell type, this is data from embryonic cell type. So this is the cell type before it has differentiated into one of the final cells, like heart cell, liver cell, whatever. Uh, so in this cell type, you see that the spread is much less. Everything is roughly around, I think, 0.93. Whereas in these fully differentiated cell types, uh, you'll see that there is a spread depending on which genes are required to be active for that cell type to perform. And also there is a difference in these contact probabilities depending on the state of the cell, whether it's proliferating, quiescent, senescent. <clears throat> okay, so there's one more uh, experimental thing that I just want to say is that there are known to be these nuclear lamin proteins. So this is the nuclear envelope. And there are known that there are this proteins, class of proteins called the lamin proteins, which organize along the periphery of the nucleus. And these proteins are known to bind segments of the chromosome. And there have been some beautiful experiments on this. And what they, so these experiments are called dam ID experiments. And what they calculate is basically which segments of the chromosome are in contact with these lamin proteins which are on the surface of this nucleus. If you look at these plots, any value which is positive is sort of in contact with the lamin. Any value which is negative is not in contact with the lamin. And what you can see from this is that there are sort of domains. So there are large regions of the chromosome which are contiguously attached to the lamin proteins, followed by large regions which are not attached to the lamin proteins. So if you think of these as some sort of domains which are called the lamin-associated domains, you can actually calculate the distribution experimentally and find out what is the sort of distribution of this lamin-associated domain length. And this is something that you get from these experiments. These are experiments from Van Steensel's group in 2000. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to go into this, but these lamin-associated domains are known to have a functional role in how genes are sort of expressed, how the gene expression is controlled and so on. It correlates with many other uh, factors of gene expression. So if we now stop and think about this, if I just concentrate on these lamin proteins, what is this a problem of? This is a problem of polymer chains inside spherical confinement, but with an attractive surface, which, is mo which, is, which models these lamin proteins. So here is our, so we have a very simple model, and we just want to see that how far can one go with, with this very simple model. We have no biological information. It's a simple bead spring polymer. With two, sort, with two types of monomers, one which can form bonds with the lamin, so the red ones are bond forming, the green ones cannot form bonds, and you can vary that fraction, you can play around with the fraction and see what happens. And this uh, surface is attractive, so whenever these monomers come within a certain distance of the surface, they feel the attraction of the surface and then they can go and bind. So since my time is, okay, so I'll just quickly go through the results. So, one is that the mean statistical properties, if you look at the average size, uh, the R squared as a function of S, S being the separation in base pairs, 
or if you look at the contact probability, the exponents that you get are roughly in the same range as the exponents that are seen in experiments. So the contact probability exponents are roughly around minus 1. The R square exponents, I think, are roughly around 0.5, this initial rise. The saturation is simply due to the spherical confinement. And also, of course, um, if you look at the volume fraction in sort of spherical shells, the, as you increase the energy, the binding energy of this uh, lamin proteins with the monomers, uh, the volume fraction near the wall, that keeps on increasing which is to be expected, uh, but it sort of mimics the heterochromatin, euchromatin separation that these regions near the wall are more densely packed. But what I want to show is this uh, very briefly, uh, these sort of lamin proximity indices which map these DAM ID experiments where we ask that, okay, <coughs> if we look at which, which monomers are in contact with the lamin proteins and which, which are not, can we construct distributions of these lamin associated domains that we get? And we do that, and if you have a homopolymer where all polymers, all of the monomers can attach, the domain length distributions that you get are simple exponentials, which does not work out very well, So, which is not what we want. We had that non-trivial sort of a domain length distribution from experiments. So what sort of a polymer do you need? So we tried a heteropolymer, um, and a random heteropolymer does not really work. What, act, what we found actually works is that these lamin associated domains need to be distributed in a Gaussian-like fashion. So their length distributions, if you choose them from a Gaussian distribution, then you get a distribution of these uh, domains which are in contact with the lamin that closely match the experimental uh, distributions. Um, and also, so I just want to flash that also these type of models where you simply have an attractive surface and spherical confinement, these also give rise to sort of territory formation. So if you have multiple polymers in your system, then these polymers sort of seg tend to segregate within their own sort of territories. Okay. So they tend not to mix with each other. Okay. So, so my time has sort of come to an end. So I will not talk about this epigenetic landscapes, uh, which is uh, how a cell divides into these different differentiated cell fates and how we can model them. There's a poster on this uh, by Vibhash who is in the audience, uh, and you can look that up. So I'll just come to the conclusion. Um, so the structure of the folded chromatin fiber, uh, what we say is that one of the major determining factors is, is interactions with these proteins such as the nuclear lamin proteins, and there is a different class of proteins which are CTCF proteins which are in the, inside the nucleus which we are modeling right now. But the interaction with these proteins often determines the large scale force strain properties of the structure. And this is about this epigenetic landscapes uh, and what we claim over there is that you need to incorporate time delayed feedback. Anyway, let me say it, since I didn't talk about it, let me forget it. Uh, so there are two posters. Uh, Bibhash has a poster on this epigenetic landscapes, and Ajay has a poster on this chromatin folding, so if you want to know in more detail, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, that's all. These are the col other collaborators. So are there questions? Yes. In this coarse green model that you make, mm -hmm. why, is, why are charges not important? Um, Said you tried making heteropolymer. Yes, but you see, you're you're talking at the DNA is charged, obviously, but you're talking at scales where you have already folded the DNA many times with these proteins, the histone proteins, which are also charged. So effectively, you do not expect the the polymers, this this polymer which you have gotten already after folding through several scales. There, you do not expect the charges to play an important role. Uh, yeah. This paper is a recent work by, uh, not recent, probably like a few years ago, Surujit and uh, Ganai and uh, yeah, Gautam. Yes. They have proposed that there are two different temperature scales. Yes. So they propose a non-equilibrium model where the gene activity in a region correlates with some sort of a temperature scale and then you have... Put two different temperature for two scales. different uh, species then... Uh, I do not understand that model very well. Uh, okay, so... Uh -huh, okay. No, no, but I, I just broadly look at the picture first. Yes, picture. but that is that is sort of a non-equilibrium thing. Yes. Uh, but these are more equilibrium studies, and we wanted to ask that what are the features you can explain purely from an equilibrium? Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Not a question, more a comment. So, mm -hmm. uh, like in a confined space, if you put a lot of lot of polymers together. Mm -hmm. They are known to go to generate different territories. For that, you don't require different temperatures true, true, true. or anything. Uh, that is true. In equilibrium, they just say even in equilibrium, if you have a confined system, you will have territories. Yeah. 
what this does is but that where they go of course you cannot control oh, that, that is the problem but what this lamin uh, interactions do is that they actually make the territory stronger than you would get purely from the confinement so you have less interpenetration between these different domains uh, than you would get purely from confinement but it is true confinement itself generates territories yes. I have some uh, clarification on your this bit spring model, yes. right? Uh, so, so you have this. Uh, uh, yeah. So, what you have a attraction between the wall and the red monomers, and between green you have attraction and no, the no. greens do not interact with the wall. Green do not interact, and the red, if they are within some distance, within distance, some cut of distance, they they have an attractive interaction with. Okay. The it's like a, they just get stick or it's like uh, you put a potential with a cutoff, is it or? Uh, yeah, so we just have a potential with a hard cutoff that whenever they come inside there, there, there's some contact energy for that. Okay. And the temperature, the energy scales are order of KBTs. Okay. Any other questions? Um, so if there are no more questions, please thank the speaker. And uh, please thank all the speakers of the session as well.